the most unusual user segment you created for an automated campaign? There's something that beyond the common segments and like car drop, etc. Tobias. Um, so one un like very unusual segmentation that we did was um, so in Finland we have a lot of customers that browse our app like quite rarely, but they don't really do an order. So like be they that they look up like a restaurant, they just check the, out the menu, or they uh, like follow one of our excellent push notifications. Um, so. <laughs> We didn't really know, like, like we want to target those customers and we want to show them an in-app to like basically push them over the edge. So we want to give them like a, like a little incentivation to actually make an order instead of just browsing through. Um, but we had a problem because we, we didn't know how to segment for those customers. Um, but what we did have was like uh, we had the session count and we had the count of orders. So what we did, we did some calculations in real time. So we were targeting people that were like, um, like less than 10% likely to do an order in that specific session. So we just took like the session count and the order count and we just calculated all of this and we were showing like a little in-app and we gave them like 10% off if they order in that session. And it actually worked. We were uh, like spending a lot of money on this. Um, but we just target like churning customers that, that didn't order like yesterday, for example. And uh, yeah, this really worked out and we were just using a custom attribute we didn't have in the beginning. Yeah. So that's like quite unusual about this segmentation. I have, a, I have a really weird uh, segment. <laughs> it's about star signs, okay? It was, in my, it was a, in my previous job, so we have 12 star signs. It was a spiritual advisor marketplace, so when the people enter, they really don't know which advisor to contact. One makes tarot, one makes palm reading, so they was kind of confused. So if you are, if you are a Gemini and I told you, okay, you are element air, so you are more in communication with air elements, so why do you contact like an advisor it's air? So it was like matching this user with the right advisor, so it is the weirdest thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it has sense. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I got one that's uh, maybe not particularly weird, um, but it was definitely weird for the delivery driver, so it goes back to good old delivery hero times as well. Um, and it's more of a targeting, but I hope it still counts. Um, so what we figured out at some point is that in the Middle Eastern regions, the kind of, um, the stuff that's weighing in the UK is the sandstorm in the Middle East, which is basically, you cannot go out anywhere to, you know, get food anymore. Um, so we figured that out. Um, and then we set up a campaign that was basically, whenever there was a sandstorm, we were getting this from an like external provider, like we have a provider API basically. Um, we were getting this into the CRM system and kind of matching it to the location where the sandstorm is and then we were sending dedicated push notifications as in, yeah, not the best ever to go out, maybe you could for, go for takeaway. Um, so that, that's <laughs> definitely weird for the delivery drivers. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that the weirdest segments that I've uh, built out have been in an attempt to sort of simulate uh, sort of a qualitative user persona, right, that's been built out by another team. So, you know, you have these beautiful user personas in the context of our product. What is a power user? What is a dormant user? What is a core user, casual user? But they're, they're qualitative, right? So they're, they're very sort of um, uh, logical and, and, you know, you, you can talk about them, which is not always how a segment looks in a CRM tool. So trying to translate those into filters in a CRM tool isn't always very easy. So for example, um, I was working with an app at one point uh, where we had users who would binge use the app, and then we also had users who would use it very regularly. And so trying to build out, okay, so I, uh, a binge user has done 100 sessions, or, or has, you know, for example, in, in the terms of Babel, has done 100 lessons in the last um, one week, or, or but has done, um, it, it, you know, also 100 lessons within the past month. So it was like trying to build out, how do you build out something that you can talk about very logically into the sort of technical um, filters that within, within a CRM tool can be really tough. So those are the weirdest ones I've found. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give you a customer one. So Airtel um, in India, um, one, of the biggest air, one of the biggest mobile pro um, providers, so they've got 400 million users, right? And uh, a lot of the people are using uh, postpaid phones, so they so prepaid phones, so they pay, pay they buy in advance. So they built a segment which was all users who were halfway through the month and uh, have used more than half the data, but stre but stre but stre uh, streamed Game of Thrones last season and sent it out <laughs> saying, "Don't miss out by a data plan." 
really works. <laughs> <laughs> really, really works. Okay. So, Ada, organisations these days have an unlimited number of variables to use for segmentation and it can get a bit overwhelming. So, how are you handling this challenge? How do you decide the number of segments and the variables to use for your business? So we start from a simple option and then slowly complicate it. So instead of starting out and being like, yeah, let's go for this very specific set of users, we'll go super vague and starting with technical limitations of something. So does the user have to have an account? Well, if we want to send them an email, then probably. How else are you going to send an email? Um, so we start with something even as simple as that and then do post analysis on that to see which things correlate with better engagement with that message which things correlate with better engagement with the app later on, and then based on that, create the segments. So we kind of do it the, the reverse way around, in a sense. I can take this really quick. Yeah, we, we do something similar where, you know, we'll kind of bundle our campaigns into different types. So, for example, if you have something like a, like a feature adoption or a newsletter, what life cycle stage does this fit best into? And so, you know, when, when you're first sort of validating a hypothesis, you, you want this bigger segment. So that's... That's how we simplify it as well, is, is start really, really broad, and then it's not until the optimization do you, do you kind of really funnel it down into a really specific filter. So. Yeah, yeah I, I can say that I, I will always start with the top customer, the golden customer, the ones that are spending the most, because at the end, in mostly all the apps, there is a 20% of the customers that are making the 80% of the revenue. So you really... You need to focus on them and start like a loyalty program and treat them very well this, this segment. So I will always start with this one and then build behavioral or geographical and so on. But please take care of your top customers. I, yeah. Um, I, in, in the interest of not agreeing uh, with <laughs> each other, <laughs> I would disagree on that one. Because how do you how do you then uh, take your not as star customers and make them star customers, if you're focusing always on your star customers? Yes, it really really depends on the product. No? In my case, <laughs> there is people with a lot of money that they can afford this kind of service. Yeah, okay, so you, and there is Definitely. people that only use the product once a year, and so it's kind of you can easily find the ones that the first month if they make four bookings. You already know they have money in the pocket. Yeah. <laughs> for for us, um, I think a lot of a lot of motivation to learn a new language comes intrinsically, right? So um, our power users are are going to be power users when they, you know, from day one, right? So we're 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 definitely more focusing on taking maybe our, our not power users and, and moving them up into higher levels of engagement. So that's kind of yeah, I think it's quite interesting that you're focusing on the loyal customers because we actually have the problem that we like always focusing on like retention. We always try to pull like the bad customers and get them active again and we're not actually doing something for active customers, right? So we're not giving them vouchers or anything because for us it's like lost money, right? Because we're giving them money but they they would order anyways, right? So um we were also like 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 trying to do some segmentations for loyal customers and we want to have like some, some more gamification for them. So what we just launched for them was like a like a week, like like a fun week where we would basically have like a push notification every day, which is very unusual for actual for active customers because usually you get like a push every every week or something like this, but not every day. And they would have like in apps then they just like play a game. Like we would have this like like food fortune, so we would have this like it's like like slot machine. They would press a button. It's like mini game, and they can like find out which food you should order. And it's like it's like quite engaging, but we're not using any vouchers for this. So um, this is like quite how we do it. It's like quite interesting to see that you're like focusing like most on the the loyal customers and not really on like inactive customers. But I, I will never give vouchers to my top customers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can give them something like top uh, priority support. You know. Or something like that. You know, the water like bottle, a, maybe. Like a, <laughs> this is for all customers. <laughs> but you can give them something else that is not a voucher, like to, to be loyal. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it's, it's interesting how we're here sort of different types of engagement, different approaches to engagement. So with a high value product, you definitely don't want to be discounting people who can pay anyway. But also the different ways you're looking to keep people using the app and making something which becomes part of their everyday life with the. Um, gamification and so on and so forth. So Christian, one for you, what sort of groundwork do you think needs to be in place before a CRM manager or product manager can embark on a strategy like this? 
Um, so um, what I keep telling, uh, or like the way that we, we would always kind of tackle this is that first and foremost you need data. That's like the biggest foundation for everything. Without data you can take funky decisions based on how you feel today, but that is probably not going to take you um, somewhere. Um, still a lot of companies do it today, so um, it <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't sound like uh, we're beyond that. Um, but data is the foundation for everything. Um, and how do you get the data is basically by making sure that um, your tracking setup is right, that you're measuring what your users are doing in the first place so that you don't, you know, um, mistakenly send some like high loyal customer a voucher which you didn't want to just because your tracking was broken. Um, so that's like the foundation. Um, without that, there's also no point in really like doing anything or even like, you know, Especially not in pretending that it would be scientific, but there's also there's actually not really a point in doing anything otherwise. Um, so the the bottom line is you need data. You need to make sure that you track the right data, which is primarily what do your users do inside of the app. If there's a part that lives outside of inside of the app, if there's a part that lives outside of the app, also make sure to track that, because mistake all the time is that yeah I know that this guy's not doing anything in the app yeah because he's using a web product all the time. Congrats. Um, so um, that's important. Um, and beyond that, I think uh, once you start setting up campaigns, um, naturally you will kind of get more sophisticated in what you do. Um, at some point you will have, you know, different models and buckets around for your user segments. Um, in most cases, you will probably um, not do anything about your super loyal ones outside of, uh, outside of few uh, cases. Um, and then you kind of take it from there and, and um, kind of see where it goes. But bottom line, data is everything. Yeah, um, the, the most important groundwork for me um, as well is a sort of opt-in and opt-in win-back uh, loop for email and push. So making sure that users are you know, really seeing the value and being opted in to our different uh, communications channels from the get-go. And then when they are opted out, making sure that they have those, those sort of user-driven prompts to, typically to opt back in um, and, and re-showing that, that value. So, I mean, we can't drive a lot of impact if we don't have anybody to uh, drive it to. So um, I think that from my perspective, that's a, that's a really important uh, groundwork to lay. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe to add to that. Um, so um, a big surprise, all this like nice retention stuff that we're talking about here and that everybody's so concerned with, um, retention or like re-engaging your users starts with the first app open really. Yeah. Um, so if you want to see groundwork in like a chronological order of which campaigns to do first, then yes, of course, it should be the onboarding. And then you kind of progress towards in like the same chronological order that your user progresses through his life cycle. And then at some point you will end up with the ones that are around for years and you still maybe want up to make a mind what to do with them. Um, but start in the beginning, keep it chronological, and yes, onboarding is the very first important kind of retention campaign. Yeah, I think for us something that's also very important is making sure that we're not misinterpreting what we're seeing. So that everybody, of course, we come into an experiment or a setup that we want to try. We're excited about this great idea for a campaign. Um, and so we really want it to be true. But like that's not how numbers work. And so it's great that we have this great idea, but then we try to shift the numbers to make that's not how it works. That's gonna fail. Uh, so having this like uh, not identifying yourself with your hypothesis, I think is also very important in looking at things uh, because that lets you get the actual result instead of what would look good on a slide or you know what would sound good at a meetup. So that's a big part, yeah. Yeah, I would also agree like you. If you're like starting up from scratch, you should look for um, events and custom attributes that you really need to like like start doing segmentations because like I really agree like you can't, can't do like anything fancy or like anything f like forbidden even like you, you you could like for example for food delivery if you go back to the topic um, <laughs> we, we we don't ask people to uh, to enter their their birthday for example because this would be data that we don't need like maybe we have like an anniversary campaign but most of the user if they see okay there's a birthday campaign then the birthday is most of the time the next day so it's um, kind of yeah kind of like this so you should really make sure that you're only taking like in the first step data that you actually need to do like the first campaigns like 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 session counts or something like last order date and uh, to do like basic segmentation with this okay. I think, so I think what I'm hearing from that is you know it's about you know, thinking about your customer thinking about what they do and thinking about the business from their perspective rather than your perspective not making hypotheses which you go out to find evidence to prove that people think that you know so 
how do they actually progress with the customer through 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 your through through your uh, experience, and then make, make make sure you've built it around that. Makes a lot of sense. So uh, actually, one of the issues with automation is that it amplifies everything that you do. So it can amplify the good, but it's also going to amplify the bad. So how do you sort of make sure you identify the sort of non-optimal experiences, and how do you manage that with your customer touch points? I'm always really interested in using two types of metrics, so leading and lagging metrics, of course, when you're, when you're looking at um, or when you're analyzing the, the impact of your campaign. So, of course, the, the leading metrics can give you a really quick sense of how your campaign is, is going. Maybe if you really need to shut it down really quick, you know, it's, it's not performing the, the way that you were thinking, uh, you can get that out of, a, out of a leading metric, but I think that the lagging metrics are the ones that will give you um, a sense of whether this was bad engagement. So, again, with this sort of um, example of, of binge using a product, um, for, for us, that's not something that, that we want. Nobody's going to you know, learn, learn a language by doing 100 lessons today and zero for the next three months. So, um, so yeah, um, perhaps we'll, we'll use a leading metric of lesson complete. That'll give us a, a really quick idea of whether or not our, our campaign is working, but then we'll use a, lag or a, a lagging metric, which is something like um, M1 retention or, or something like that. So in the second month after our campaign, are users still continuing to do lessons? And that, that'll give us a, a good idea of if we've sort of driven bad retention okay. or bad engagement, yeah. So we're going to get to the, to the really nasty uh, positive, uh, sorry, positive, but really nasty negative outcomes that a campaign can have. Um, so um, it's definitely worth uh, looking at it, um, especially in situations where there's some higher up saying, yeah, but I really want this campaign, it like, makes perfect sense to me. Um, this is the point where you should especially focus on them, but you should always look on the, on the negative um, outcomes of your campaigns. Um, and they are more obvious ones and then there are less obvious ones. Um, so the most obvious one with any kind of push notification per se is uninstalls, really. It's a very direct one. Any push notification that you send out will per se generate uninstalls. The question is how many? Um, and is that still worth the effort then? So if you're making, you know, 10% more money with the guys that receive something, but then at the same time you create 10,000 uninstalls, is that living up for the, the loss in lifetime value? Um, that's the that's the Captain Obvious, um, still not everybody looking at it, but that's what people should do. Um, and then there's like less obvious ones, um, or also ones that take some more time. Um, so whenever you see App Store ratings, so like reviews that carry a message saying, hey, yeah, cool app, but like the push notifications, yeah, getting them every day. Um, this is where you should start to think about your strategy. Um, <laughs> um, we, we've seen that happening, um, and without, without telling any names, um, I know that you can put it, you can bring it to a level where, let's say, um, even Apple will be um, not so pleased about your push notification game anymore, um, and will let you know. This is really like this is the this is already the end of the spectrum. This is far beyond what's like reasonable, yeah. but it like it's possible. Um, so th then they really reaching out to you, telling you that guys, the push notifications to send, that has to change or your app will be gone. So that's like the the different levels of that I see. Uh, for me, the best way to know if a campaign is working or not is just using a control group, and you're probably all using control group for all the campaigns. <coughs> I don't know if the audience know, control group is like percentage of users that are not receiving this communication. Could be a 10 or 20%. So you just compare. Okay? If a control group is making more bookings, more in-app purchase than the campaign, then you're doing things bad. So you need to shut down this campaign. And this is also there are some kind of metrics that you need to look a little bit deeper. Like for example, you send an email, you have an excellent open rate, like 30, 40%. But then you further look and, and you see like, okay, they just enter to the email, they open the email just to unsubscribe. <laughs> so you just need to really go deep, no, you know? <laughs> so this you is need like to double check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think depending on the product, uh, like as you mentioned, the, the leading and lagging metrics, that's something that is very also important to clue because as um, some of you may know, periods are usually once a month. Um, you, so you expect the user to track a period once a month. Some of them will also track other things like headaches or cramps or ovulation related stuff. Um, but a lot of users will just track when they bleed because they just don't want to bleed on things. And that's their goal in using clue. 
um, when they don't have other symptoms that concern them. So for those users, they're going to be there once a month. So what we're looking at is month one, month two, month three retention. But we're not going to set up a campaign and then wait a year <laughs> to get results. Uh, so we have these metrics like amount of data tracked, um, how quickly they responded to a message, whether they've dismissed a number of messages or not interacted with a number of messages or if they are interacting with them, but just not tracking because it's not relevant to them at that point. So it's also important to look at whether your user can even be expected to increase their behavior in such a way. Um, or in our case, for instance, well, they didn't just track their period, but also one instance of a headache. We're winning. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it also makes sense to talk to customer care and the social media team because <laughs> um, like customers are quite vocal if they receive something they don't really like. So if you try to have like like real time communication via push, which is like uh, like quite often used for, for for our case. So we, we like if there are elections, then we like like try to sit, like like push people to something. We're not like taking like any political stance, obviously, but we like 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 taking taking this into account in our communication, which is like performing quite well, but also a lot of people like disagree with what we're saying or they just like annoyed by it. So it's make, it makes sense to um, always talk to customer care. Well, the like, customer care will let you know when something happens, usually. So, yeah. Cool. That, that's useful. I mean, it's, it's interesting when you think talk about control groups and how you look at, you know, what is and what isn't really working for you. Certainly in uh, marketing automation, MarTech, when I sp speak to a CMO and uh, they'll have a dozen guys like me who's going in and saying, we're doing this for you. And when you add it all up, you know, you should be doing double the revenues doing because everybody's giving this 25% uplift. So trying to understand what's true incrementality is almost like the, old, the holy grail, if you like. So I'd like to ask you, Tobo, back to you, which is how do you actually quantify what's a real efficiency improvement relative to what looks like an efficiency improvement might but might not be? <laughs> um, so like usually um, like we always have control groups in every campaign that we're doing like be it ad hoc or be like an, an automation campaign uh, so this is like the ground that we, uh, like that we do all, all the time uh, we are also doing a b testing all the time or like abc testing abcd testing whatever so we're doing this to find out like which campaign is like performing the best um, but then it really depends on the campaign itself like what's like the purpose of the campaign like what do i want to achieve and also on the goal of the of the company, like do I want to be profitable with this, or do I just want to have like the maximum activations on this campaign? Um, so, um, for example, when you build up a welcome flow, you want to push people that have only made one order to the second order. Like, what do I actually want to achieve? I want to basically push them to the second order, but actually that's not really the goal. The goal is to have like the third and the fourth order. So what we always do is when we set a campaign, we look back like in like, like, like 30 days or like, like 60 days even, um, how did that uh, customer develop? Like did he make multiple orders with this or was it just this one activation? Because then like the metric is obviously different. I don't care about the, the CDR of this one campaign. I just look at the like lifetime of this customer if we uh, achieve what we wanted to do with the campaign. Yeah, I mean, um, if if you're talking about efficiency in terms of workflow as well, so for example, if you're trying to um, uh, convince a C-level management or as a C-level manager to to implement a marketing automation tool, for example, um, uh, what what I would say is that these lagging metrics should always be rising. You know, you should always be working towards a flat retention curve and and shifting it up, and and part of that is going to be um, uh, yeah optimization, of course but you can only optimize once things are automated, right? So if, it, if you're spending all of your time on batch sends, you know, you're sending something monthly, and, uh, but, but you have to put it together on your own monthly, that's a lot of time that, that you're spending on just a, a simple send that's perhaps not actually getting any better each time, right? So, um, so once you can displace your, your, um, your effort to optimization, those lagging metrics should still be rising, perhaps not as quickly, of course, as, as, as when you're first putting out, putting out a new concept, but, but they should always be, be sort of rising with, with optimization. Let's say. All right, uh, high time for a controversial response, I guess. Um, <laughs> finally, yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to, um, on, on, this, uh, on this question, I wanted to raise the point that um, they are actually two different kinds of control groups, and it's a bit like siblings and one of them is like super popular everybody wants to play with it um, and everything likes that kind of kit that's the control group for a campaign because fun fact that will always look awesome um, and the, the other the other sibling yeah nobody really wants to touch they all feel a bit yeah maybe it's sick 
Um, <laughs> but there is, there is value in actually doing the other one as well, and the other one is the global control group. So when we're talking about control groups, um, there's obviously one that comes with the campaigns, and it's pretty easy. It's like, yeah, people receive a campaign or they don't receive the campaign. And it's pretty easy. Um, the thing about it is that, um, especially push notification campaigns, will almost always lead to app activity. And if app activity is what you're looking for, then this will always look super great, even if the creative is completely fucked. Um, <laughs> the other control group is what you should do, ideally, before you get one of the mobile CRM tools in place, and that is 10% of your user, like whatever percentage, 10% is a kind of a healthy ratio, um, of your users that don't receive any messaging at all from any of your campaigns with the funky new tool that you got. Um, you set that up when you start integrating the tool, and you also make sure that on a random basis people are being at added to that bucket so that it always stays 10% of your overall users, meaning that 10 new users come in, one goes into the group, um, and then you wait, and then after something like six months, depending on how many users you have, six months or a longer time frame, depends, um, you revisit all of that and you actually look at, okay, so how's the, how's the incremental up, because that's the only incremental uplift really, how's the incremental uplift between people that didn't receive anything, which is the same as I would have just not gotten any tool and just carried on with looking outside the window, versus the guys that have received something. Um, now, why is this the sibling that nobody wants to play with? Because it can turn out pretty nasty, um, as in it can be negative, to, versus the return that you put in in terms of time and especially money um, into integrating all of this. And then every, every marketing manager would look pretty, pretty shit versus the, um, the, his boss. And that's why people tend to not do it, um, although I would always recommend doing it. Um, so yeah, just wanted to bring it up. Just a piece of advice there, that's why you don't tell people that you put a global control on there until you have good results, so. <laughs> there, there you go. That's why nobody wants to play with that sibling. <laughs> In my case, it was BI, they put this hold up group, so they can measure what we are doing and show it to the rest of the company. It looks good for now, so we are happy. And they can also calculate the cost of the tool and the salaries and everything, if it's worth it to have a CRM team, actually. It's, it's like, um, Without getting too like philosophical about this, it's actually kind of interesting that um, how broken all of that is, um, because especially in like um, companies that are driven by VC cash heavily, there's essentially nobody in the company that would lose money even if the return is negative from using the tool. Um, so it's a bit like it's a bit like ad fraud even. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, um, I urge you to do a global control group. It can also obviously in a lot of cases it, it can turn out positive, which it does for like e-commerce for sure and a lot of other cases but yeah doing it is like generating value uh, what I also always try to recommend whenever we're doing a campaign is to have a kind of fake control like a messaged control is what we call it um, so if we're testing a new type of push message for instance we've come up with a grand new idea um, for instance when we had the um, big climate strike situation uh, we quickly came up with a concept of telling people that, hey, a green solution to your cycle is using a menstrual cup, because then you're not producing waste, it's reusable, you use it for 10 years, you just boil it in a pot and don't tell anyone which one. Um, so, yeah, that's how you sanitize it. So so we were like, yeah, this is a great thing to share with users. We have a couple articles on the website, so we can send a push linking them to those articles of how to use the cup, and we can try like not really activist, and then like, hey, the world is on fire. <laughs> Um, but then we also were like, well, people click pushes in general, so we also sent a very neutral push with like, hey, there's a new article on our website to see if the pushes we're sending are actually performing, or if just sending something is performing. Mm -hmm. So then you're not being lied to. Yeah, I, I definitely don't have the right answer for, for this sort of controversial topic I'm about to bring up. Um, but uh, I, we, we also did this um, uh, at, a, at, at a past job. I was working with, uh, with an app called Fishbrain, which is a social media app for uh, anglers, for, for, for fishermen. And uh, we, yeah, um, we were using a weather API because actually a lot of fishermen prefer to fish in the rain, uh, which is something I was not aware of. So um, when, we, when there was this rainy weather forecast, we would send them a push saying it's going to rain in your, in your area. Um, but we, we wanted to do this exact same thing, was test, this, um, test the concept of giving them such a personalized message, basically. But it, 
you know, uh, just sending them something like uh, go fishing tomorrow, there are so many different variables going on in there. How do you know that it's a clean test between, you know, sort of a, a very neutral message like come check out our new newsletter or a new piece of content and then something like, uh, you know, you use this menstrual cup to stay green, you know, similar to, to, to this, you know, go fishing tomorrow versus it's going to rain tomorrow so um, the waterways will be clear, you know. I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, I just like... <laughs> Do we have any fishermen in the house? <laughs> Anglers. I'm just sorry. <laughs> so um, I guess the, although that's kind of basically impossible to measure, um, so maybe not the best answer, but um, I think the bottom line, the bottom line uh, metric that would be influenced by that is the experience that the fishermen have fishing, depending on why it's a good day to go fishing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, maybe then you do in like NPS, how did the fishing go, yeah. and then. That would be the metric that I would maybe look at. Okay, so staying on the theme, so bear in mind what we've talked about about this approach. Not fishing, the theme <laughs> of being able to measure incrementality, etc. Um, has anybody got an example they're prepared to share about where they've done some sort of segmentation, automation about this, and it's really bombed, like it's really not worked? <laughs> Yeah, if, if my boss could just cover her ears for a second, that would be really great. Um, <laughs> no, no, um, I, I, you know, I'm, 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 um, I'm a big fan, I'm, I'm very friendly, and I'm a big fan of telling everybody how awesome, amazing, and gorgeous they are, you know, all the time. So I always have up my sleeve a store of sort of like milestone campaign, right? So um, I'd, at one point I was building out um, milestone campaigns for, for an app, and, and I wanted it to have all of the bells and whistles, you know, we had gifts, we had, you know, great puns in the messaging, all of it, you know, but it takes a lot of time to prepare that, you know, you have all your Jira tickets, you gather it all up, you build it out, you send it out, you put a 50% control on it because you want statistically significant results ASAP, and you let it run for four weeks, and all 12 people who received it loved it, <laughs> you know? Because, you know, uh, the, I, I mean, basically the solution to that is to have a really, really strong prioritization framework, right? So looking at the impact of a potential campaign uh, as a function of the reach of, the ca of that campaign. And, um, and not just the reach, so how big is the segment that we're targeting, but also how often is the segment uh, performing this trigger trigger criteria, which would also be the, the automation together. So uh, amateur mistake, I don't do it anymore. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, lo looking at both of those things, size of segment and also um, frequency of trigger. So yeah, for me, um, <clears throat> so we were selling one of our businesses and uh, the, the company that, that bought this business was asking me if I can set up an in-app notification uh, to basically every user in, in, in that country, like to like if you visit the app, you would have this like like redirect to the app store to download like their app basically. Um, so I set this up and uh, all looked fine. Um, I just like launched it for like the, the accounts we have in that country, and they asked me to do it like like on, on like a geolocation based targeting. So I wanted to like like target everyone like if, if you're in that country, you're opening the app, um, you would see that in app. So I made I built that in app. It was not clickable, so you couldn't remove it. And it was just saying on like the local language and in English, like, hey, we're shutting down, use this app instead. Everything went well, I like showed it to them, everything was approved, so I went home, it was like in the evening. Um, like two hours later, I, was, uh, I got a call from my manager, um, yeah, we need to talk about this campaign, because um, uh, our colleagues in Canada, they, uh, they uh, report they're getting this in-app. And I was like, what the fuck, like, I, I, I saw this geolocation thing, so I like, 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 I like saw the map, I like, like, like zoomed in, I like like really like like put like I don't know if you know how polygons work, but basically you have to draw like a picture around like a country or like a sp specific like like town or whatever you want to target, um, and then you just save it and that's it, and then it's like showing up for everyone in that area. So I went home, I looked up this uh, like polygon, and it was like right across the globe. It was like 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 basically like like through like a like a like <laughs> like a strip through Canada to like Vancouver and they were like seeing this exact in it and since we have basically in in that country we have the service as well um, so basically we're showing up for them in English like hey we're shutting down and <laughs> and they couldn't click it away and obviously this was like a, like a huge PR stunt like they were reaching out to them and 
And so we were just lucky that they have like the time difference, so it was quite early for them, and not too many people saw it. So in that evening, I just crafted some emails that I sent to everyone who saw that in it. Right. Yeah. So and so like never like create an email that you can't click away, and never use a polygon. That's like my takeaway for this. <laughs> cool. So I'm conscious of time, so we do one more question, then we're going to open up the questions from the um, audience. So when you automate and you personalize these days, we all we were spoken about how much data you need. Um, so one of the challenges these days, though, is like how do you ensure then people's privacy concerns are taken care of? Because the more data you want, the more private, the more the more information you've got on people, and the more people worried about privacy these days. So, come on up. Um, so obviously, as a health app, we're we're big on privacy. We would not want um, uh, when is the last time you had particularly heavy bleeding to be shared to Facebook, for instance. That would probably not be great. Or uh, oh, unprotected sex, tweet it. Um, <laughs> Not optimal. So uh, we, we only store that kind of data, the data that you track as a user in our back end very securely, and we do not let that data out of there. So for instance, in the CRM tools that we use, we don't know what you tracked. We know that you tracked X number of data points. So we know, oh, this might be an active tracker, but did they track that they're bleeding every day for the last 30 days? Did they track headaches? Did they track cravings? We don't know. Uh, so if we want to run campaigns like that, it has to be back-end triggered. So then we involve an engineer, uh, but that is the way to keep their data safe. And we don't, we try our best, we go beyond what our lawyers say, because we're like, no, but we don't need this. We don't need to know what birth control they're on. We can do that back-end triggered, it's fine. So we personally would not want our data treated in a certain way, so we don't do that to our users. It's a very, yeah. Yeah, um, whether our users, or, or, you know, the fact that our users were studying German last Saturday night and not in the club is also very embarrassing for them. So, um, you know, no, um, we, we definitely, I, I would say our, perhaps all data is, is sensitive, of course, but we don't have it quite as sensitive as, as a sort of health app. But um, in, in terms of also like groundwork for, for data privacy, having a really, really strong um, sort of verification, uh, um, um, yeah, uh, framework in places is, is also really, really important. So um, I, in terms of data, I'm thinking a little bit more about GDPR, right? So making sure that we're, we're um, targeting the right users, that, that takes having a really good sort of verification uh, framework in, in place. Yeah, um, so thanks for finally bringing up GDPR. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think um, without like uh, extending this for 30 more minutes, um, I think a statement that will make you the yeah, a good friend with your data privacy guy in the company um, is that you can or you should only do what is relevant for there's a nice German term to it um, for like designing the user experience in a way that it's kind of meant to be um, as long as you are under that I think you're doing pretty all right at least this is the argument you should always use with your data guy uh, data privacy dude um, yeah period <laughs> if I could, if I could add something um, else, it's that another another part of privacy that just came to my mind, especially when it comes to our app, is that when we do our CRM activities, it's the data that we share through messages. Because something that we, for instance, have to take into account is that uh, some people with cycles trying to get pregnant will be working in a company that is not friendly towards parental leave. So we don't want to send them a push message that's like, "Hey, today's a good day to try and get pregnant." Because what if their manager sees it and fires them? Um, a segment I recently, or like half a year ago or so made, is a segment of countries that have laws against LGBTQ people. And we don't message those countries with messages about LGBT content, trans healthcare, because it could put the users in danger. So that's a whole other level of privacy as well, and kind of like ethical messaging um, that we take into account for sure. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously if you operate in, uh, in like Europe, then it's, um, it's like GDPR time. So you have to make sure that you're only collecting data that it's like actually necessary for your campaigns. Uh, but you also have to be quick because um, like you give basically users the right to delete your data. And if they request to delete the data, you have to be quick and delete it actually in like, like three days. And this is most of the time going through like many different departments. It's not only CRM because they probably complain at customer care. Customer care takes it to like BI or product, they delete in the back end and then you, make, you need to make sure that it's also deleted in your tool and 
this all needs to have, have to be done in like, like three days. So you need to be quick when it comes to data protection. So maybe maybe one word, one last closing word to that, um, or the general advice. Um, in general, with all that like um, data consciousness in mind, there's no need to be like overly personalized with information that's like completely useless. As in, don't let your like you know uh, the guy that has been sending out your mails for the last ten years tell you that it's an awesome idea to have like the first name in the push notification. Hey, Christian, it's Sunday again. It's like no. So yeah, nothing that is like obviously unnecessary because I I see that quite regularly. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I would also say that like in terms of maximizing relevance, it's not always um, about the content, it's about when the user is receiving it. So the behavioral segments, I would say, are kind of the most important ones in terms of personalization. And, and yeah, the, the, the first name is really cute, really nice, but, it, but it's not necessarily the, the thing that's going to make it super relevant to the user. It, it, like, in fact, it can make it like, super creepy. Like, yeah. I apologize. Um, <laughs> Uh, and often with, with first names, which is something the user can input, they can uh, run themselves into a corner. So funny story, um, <laughs> we had a user, <laughs> we had a user tweet that uh, they forgot that they set their first name and clue to asshole. <laughs> and so at some point we were like, let's test the whole first name thing, you know? So our user got an email about how maybe they want to buy the premium feature, starting with, hey, asshole. <laughs> so, you know, you don't always need the first name. Um, my comment, just, just, just go anywhere near that. So, I'm going to call that to the close from the questions perspective and open it to the audience to see if we've got any questions for our lovely and amusing panelists. So any questions from the floor? Hey, Marcus. Um, quick question to all of you, actually. Um, how do you actually take your input that you gain from the data that you collect and feed it back to product? Because a lot of the things that you are witnessing in terms of unsubscribes, in terms of actions that are being handled, in terms of questions that we're getting to customer service, will actually have to do with your product. Is there a loop that you guys have that you follow that you can talk about and how you provide that input back to the product team? Thank you. Um, I guess the TLDR is we talk to them a lot. Uh, so we have weekly syncs with, uh, we have three cross-functional teams working on the product on different aspects of it. And we have a lunch once a week or like an, a coffee thing where we just sit down and chat about what we're planning, what they're planning, making sure that's aligned. Um, uh, we have shared channels between our messaging team and product and support where we all talk. Um, uh, we use Jira to manage our workflow and our workloads and our experiments. Uh, which is connected to Zendesk, the support tool we use. And so uh, support agents can directly connect any customer complaint or praise to a campaign that we're running. So then we have very like or structured feedback in that sense and also the open communication since we are only 60 people. So it's pretty easy to just walk up to a PO and have questions or they have questions for us. Yeah, um, so it's mission critical to kind of have every, anything you do in CRM slash retention being aligned with your product people. Um, because interestingly enough, it's like it's like all marketing guys discussing all this and marketing guys being in charge of it. But CRM as a topic is so close to the product that it's like, it's actually kind of part of the product, um, which is very different to, um, for example, paid user acquisition campaigns where you would rarely fuck up the product if you would do a mistake. CRM, yeah, well, we've seen it, not so much. Um, so, um, no, it's, no, no, I was looking at him with the, with the message in the, in the app, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so, no, it's mission critical. Um, the very minimum is that the product people understand, because, you know, sometimes even if they're, like, bonuses tied to, like, metrics that you can influence, um, the, the minimum is that they understand how, how you influ is in CRM campaigns influence the metrics. That's the absolute minimum. Um, what you should do is be in a very close sync with them, telling them what is going on and how that might have an influence on their lives. I think it's really important just from the beginning to start what, what is called the growth teams. It's a cross-functional team of one product, one marketeer and one BI, one data scientist. If you have three, these three persons working in just one metric from the beginning and you are, they are going to be always aligned, always focus. It could be a CRM or it could be a one of acquisition or it's always switching and for a different metric. So if you're focusing in 
and subscription and things like that. So they focus on this and they are really aligned. And this is, this is really difficult when you are in a big company and it starts to be silos and so on and the miscommunications. <coughs> And when you are in a startup, that we are all in the same room, you just shout to them and, <laughs> and you fix it fast. But when you are scaling and you are starting to be a big company, it's become a challenge. So you need to be something that you need to do from the beginning. Mm, yes, yeah, so for us with product, it's um, it, it's always that we have like one point, like like a one single point of truth for all important stuff. So for example, the unsubscription of a customer. Like if they complain to customer care, customer care needs to be able to unsubscribe this user like for us basically. Um, so for those, we always have uh, like one single point of truth and we have a daily sync that runs daily, uh, that basically syncs the data between this. Um, furthermore, we have an SDK, which is like more like CRM relevant. So we're like tracking sessions uh, in the app and, and stuff like this that's not really interesting for product because they care more like about like the, the order, the basket size and like everything related to the order itself. So do we have any more questions? Do we have another question? Um, maybe a quick one from my side. Uh, my name is Ricardo from WeFox, the, the biggest insure tech in Europe. Um, I'm, uh, my question is about, um, I think the topic today is CRM. Uh, and the mobile, and, and I, I heard you guys talking a lot about push notifications. And in my phone, I get emails, I get text messages, I get phone calls, I get in-app notifications. Um, it's everything else dying in push notifications is the thing to go, or what are different, I don't know, uh, marketing mix that we can use? Uh, should we use only one, should we use many? Um, I, I'm just curious because I heard a lot about push notifications today, and um, I think it, CRM is much more than just push notifications. So if I answer, that would be a sales answer, so I'm going to let somebody else do it. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I would just say that, uh, I mean, if you're looking at three major channels, you, you have several channels as, as, as we saw from Mike, but I would say sort of the three major ones from a mobile CRM perspective, you've got email, you've got push, and you've got in-app. But, um, but they all serve very, very different purposes, right? So, um, so email is perhaps going to give you a, a more sort of non-product related um, information, I, I, I would say, are, are a lot of good campaigns to send through email. Um, if you want a user to respond and do something in the product right now, um, that's the push notification. Um, that, that's what I would say. And then in-app is a really, really tricky one because it actually interrupts the user the user's natural um, experience within the app. So that I would say that one's sort of the trickiest one, but that is sort of sending you um, vital information about, about what you're currently doing, um, but, sh but should be used in, in really smart ways. So all three of the channels are super valuable, um, um, but they're, they're serving different purposes. And then one of the reasons I would say we, we perhaps talk about push is because in terms of production, it is likely the easiest to produce, right? So you're, you're not working, you're, you know, you have rich push, but you're typically not working super, super much on, on a lot of sort of HTML build out like you would with email or with in-app. And the text is really short and the, they're, they're really easy to produce. So um, in terms of experimentation, they're, they're, a, they're a really nice channel to experiment different content types as well. Uh-oh, what are you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> um, so to answer the question, no, um, the rest is not dying. Um, and push notification, as we just said, is just the captain obvious for like mobile people. Um, the ideal scenario, though, is that you have one tool, technical solution, that manages all your different kind of channels and yes they are like they differ between companies so if you are a telco then SMS probably is a thing for you um, if you are not a telco then probably not especially not in Europe um, but the ideal scenario is that you have one tool that allows you to control all the different channels and you have one source of truth for the user profile meaning you know the mail address belongs to this and that mobile device belongs to this and that post address if you are into like physical mailing. Um, and then the channel to use is just a function of which message I'm going to send and how urgent is it, how rich is the content because you will not send this like novel in a push notification, you can but it will not work very well. Um, so ideal scenario, all the different channels are not equal but they don't dictate like it's not that they would dictate what you send, it's the other way around. You would make up something that you want to send and then what, may, what channel to use is just a function of how the user should be reached with it. 
Yeah, to talk about push notifications. So I would say like you, you should do all of it because you need to be like kind of like tech different in what you're doing. But like push is quite a good channel because people are like used to push notifications. So it's a difference if I send you a push notification or an SMS, for example, because I can't send you the right content, right? Also, um, push is uh, like very handy when it comes to deep links. So you can like directly basically like skip some of the steps in your app, right? You can like directly go to your basket. You can go to like, like apply filters and all that stuff. So it's really handy. And you can send like more push notifications than you would send emails, for example. Like I, I would get like bored from emails if I get like, like three of them. Um, also, it's like way harder to set up emails, obviously, than like uh, just like creating like a push notification. So yeah. Uh, also, it depends on what the user, um, what user knowledge you have about someone. So the push is the one of the simpler because all you need is push opt-in on the device. Uh, whereas email, the person needs to have an account in-app, they have to actually enter the app, which in the case of Clue, again, once a month for some people. Uh, so the push is the quickest to iterate on in terms of an experiment. So that's why we will often test out a new idea with a push if possible uh, before we delve into the other channels. Oh, to, me, uh, to me, my favorite channel, it's, it's not push, it's not email, it's not email, it's inbox. There is you can create like an inbox inside of the app and manage all this, and it's not about push, it's about pull. It's the customer wanting to open your app to see the content. And you just use badges. Who, if you see a badge, you're going probably to click. <laughs> and it's not annoying you like a push or an email, it's super invasive. But just a badge, it's small, it's there. You just want them to take it up, out. So you just enter, and if you're giving valuable content, then it's, 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 it's really effective. But maybe you need to educate with a push to let them know that you have this inbox there or news feed or how it's, it's called. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so, so just one word from us on that. So when we're speaking to people about marketing automation, we start with the journeys. So at the beginning I said you have these personas, you've got these journeys, you work out what touch points you need to do. And it's a couple of things which is really both context, which is the best one to use because you can't put long form content in push. So if you're a principal bank and someone's applied for a loan and got the loan approved, they need long phone content. That's going to be an email. Um, if it's something you want to grab some attention, an SMS is great because people do open SMSs. They don't expect it to be long, so they can just click a link and come back to the experience that they want. So it's all about what's the most appropriate format and using all the different levels. So you orchestrate through the different levels using a tool. And obviously our tool does it, but you orchestrate through yeah. different levels. Question for everybody. Um, how much should CRM already be planned in the product experience, product experience up front, and how much should be dedicated like bottom on the bottom of the front? And that's connected also on the privacy part of that weird name in German that you mentioned, because uh, you already discussed about how CRM is close to product, but then it's in marketing and silos and blah, blah, blah. But how strong should be the product vision to, to be visionary and already involved uh, CRM in, uh, in the experience? In my opinion, from the beginning, if it's possible to have this kind of cross-functional team where you have a marketer, a BI, a uh, product together. It, it, but um, it's not always the case. And there is a lot of conflict sometimes, so you need to be, you know, it's not, it's not easy. But ideally, it will be from the beginning. So I think it really depends on the feature that you want to have. So I think it's something more long-term. Product is usually better in doing it than like like CRM launching it in app, for example. It's like you're using a tool, and it's not not always like the same experience as you would use it in the app. So I would say everything long-term uh, product can do better. Um, but I would say that CRM is quicker. So if you have like a short-term campaign or you want to do something immediately, then CRM is always the way to go. And then obviously they need to align to not have any like like the things doubles, but um, I think it's more important to have like a good uh, experience in the app than like have a like, good CRM in apps, for example. Uh, something that I can add to that is that oftentimes for us, a uh, product will come to us and ask us, can we test this hypothesis with CRM? So instead of implementing an entire feature, an entire screen, we'll just do a quick in-app. Or instead of enabling a whole new type of reminder, let's just do a push message and see how many people actually click it and are interested. 
Uh, so that's one way in which we work together. Um, another is that we will actively be listening. We have these all hands meetings once a week where product often gives updates on what they're planning and we'll often just pop up with a question like, oh, how about using CRM in this way in conjunction with your idea? And they will do the same when we're presenting our stuff. So we all try to work in sync. It has to be an effort from both sides. Yeah, I think it also definitely de uh, depends on the product as well. So I know earlier I brought up Hopper and it's a like a kind of a core part of their product, a core part of their service to remind you to purchase a flight because the, the whole point of, of the app is to buy the flight at the time when it's the cheapest. Um, that's also similar for Babel, I'd say. So um, our, our sort of learning reminders are a core part of our product. You know, we as CRM managers, our teachers, we are supposed to be reminding our students to learn the language, you know. So it definitely de depends also on the product and if, uh, if kind of the, the the yeah the 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 type of product requires this sort of continuous nudging or, or, or reminding to, to do something. Are there any more questions? We take one more. I know one. We did. Have you ever had a communication or well, like notification or email that's tied to a? external data like weather you mentioned or I don't know market data and I think that automates the notifications or emails? Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan and um, I, I've, I've done some triggered from, from external API campaigns but the big ones that I love are um, that populate with, with data coming from an external API. So, for example, um, I was working with a, with a video streaming service for a while, so similar to Netflix, um, and they would send recommendations that would actually populate data coming from the IMDB API. So there's a ton of data that, you, that is out there that is available for everyone that you don't actually need to build in-house or have in-house, in excuse me, but you can still use it in, in an automated way. So, so I, I'm, I would say uh, APIs, well, big the, fan. What was the campaign? Case. How did you utilize that? Yeah, um, it, yeah. So for for us, um, it was triggered off of finished a series, and and it was an in-app campaign that then came up and and um, recommended a new series based on on what on the user behavior. But uh, basically, we didn't have to type in all of the data about these these different series. It populated from yeah from the IMDb API. So. It, it made our work workflow process much easier, and it probably also made the content much much more valuable, you know. Yes. And I, I do the weather. It's the first one. I think it's the easy one to create. So if you are, have a pickup in an airport in LA, so you know one day before it's going to be sunny, or a, 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 we make like a five day forecast, making emo emojis like a sunny. Uh, it's a very visual. We don't want the, the customer to click, it's just information to be, give value. But now I'm looking into getting flight, we have a tracking number, a flight number, so I'm trying to find a good API to get if a flight is in on delay and things like that, but it's a, it's a, a lot of work. <laughs> the work with APIs, but it's the future. Did you it's see any it. leverage success? It's, it's get, it, we, we cannot really measure it. We can ask the customer directly, for example, but we are not searching for them to, to click on it. It's just giving them value about his journey to upgrade this travel experience. No? We're doing the same like with city guys. No? They're going to LA, so we send you a push. That it's connected to the inbox or, or to a blog with money for hotels or restaurants or bars that are in LA or New York or whatever you are traveling. And it's giving value to the customer. Monitor this by a cohort to see that that control didn't get this and others got more of that, or do you just leave it at that? Yeah, no, the city guys and things like that, we can really track it because it's something that you are going to click. But the weather, we can ask the customer. Do you think it is relevant for you to receive this kind of notification? And they can choose yes. Then we still continue. We send more if they say no. So we. We stop it. It's just kind of a preference center inside of a push, kind of. Cool. So look, uh, we are going to be here for a while. Um, so what we're going to do is call it a close now. 
most of the panel will be able to stay. So if you've got further questions, uh, have another drink with us, come and have a conversation. But thanks very much. I'd like you to give the panel a round of applause. I think it'll be really interesting. Thank you very much.